Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and today I'm going to be talking about the landmark Herodotus. And also in the second half of the video, I'll be showing some swords that are a part of my collection that relate to time periods, which Herodotus discusses. So this was my first time reading the histories of Herodotus but all the way through. I had read excerpts before, and of course I was familiar with Herodotus when uh, through many other things that I had read. Um, there's two of note that I can mention really quickly and show. Uh, the first one is a travelogue. They're actually both travelogues. The first one is um, Travels with Herodotus by Reitzar Kapuzinski. I'm not entirely sure if I'm saying that name right. right. Um, but he was a Polish... Uh, journalist, and this is about his travels in the 1950s, uh, where he always carried with him a copy of Herodotus. So he discusses Herodotus in this. And the other book that I had read was The Way of Herodotus, uh, Travels with the Man Who Invented History by Justin Marazzi. Um, and in this case, the author is actually retracing the steps of Herodotus, uh, discussing what Herodotus wrote, uh, maybe uh, how factual it is or isn't, and also what's there today. Is there anything uh, similar? Are the same sites possibly there? Um, this was a fun, a fun travelogue. In addition to reading the landmark Herodotus, I was reading some other supplementary materials as well. Um, first, there was um, the uh, Penguin Historical Atlas of Ancient Greece, which I've been uh, I was thumbing through quite a bit. Uh, Michael K. Vaughn, um, another booktuber, was kind enough to send this to me. I was also uh, reading through two books by Michael Grant. Uh, I have not finished either. I am going to go through these kind of slowly. Uh, the first one is The Ancient Historians, and here you can see a whole list of uh, the ancient historians there. They're actually not really in chronological order for some reason. I don't really know the rhyme or reason <laughs> that they put them there. I'm sorry for the glare. I do have a window in front of me. Um, but uh, he has chapters on the various ancient historians. This isn't the writing of the historians. It is like mini biographies about each of them, a little bit of an analysis as well. Uh, and I have had a discussion with um, Mark over at Booktown with Elvis. Uh, he and I are going to kind of embark on a journey of reading ancient historians together, um, probably in chronological order. I'm not entirely sure, but thinking that makes the most sense. And uh, I'm going to read this as we go through those figures. So like, for instance, uh, I think we're next going to read Thucydides. I'll read that chapter when we get through there. Um, in addition to that, another work by Michael Grant that I was looking through was um, reading the classical historians. And these are actually excerpts from these historians uh, with also a little bit of material about these uh, historians. So, of course, I kind of went through the um, Herodotus chapter, but he also has some other people, like here are two figures who actually predated Herodotus, and he has some excerpts from their work. So this is another one that I'll be going through at the same time. And I was also thumbing through an old book that I have that I think has been published many times, and that's uh, Warfare in the Classical World. Uh, an Illustrated Encyclopedia of Weapons, Warriors, and Warfare in the Ancient Civilizations of Greece and Rome by John Ware. This is an older work, but uh, it's got some great illustrations. Uh, it's one that I've kind of gone through quite a few times. I've never really gone like page to page, all the way uh, cover to cover. I might do that next year as we continue to go through um, these various historians. But, um, you know, for me, it's just kind of been a reference book at this point. But, uh, Again, I, I might actually go through it the entire way this time. So uh, with all that, all right, as I'm looking through those as well and checking with uh, those sources as I go through, I was, of course, going through the landmark Herodotus. It was part of a group read that happened over the summer. I'm just finally getting to making a video about it now. Um, and I really had a great time with this. Uh, that Two points that I had known uh, two points of criticism, I should say. I had known about Herodotus going in that I was wondering how I would feel um, when I actually read it. The first thing is that, of course, Herodotus kind of had a, a certain reassessment at one point um, where I found that a lot of things that he wrote maybe were not true. Was he purposely not telling the truth? Uh, 
I tend to think not. I tend to think that he was actually going for accuracy. Um, but that, it gave him the nickname, not only the father of history, because he is considered the first historian, but also the father of lies. Um, to that, I would say he actually attempts to be as honest as possible. Uh, and he tries to stick to his sources. Where he gets outlandish, it tends to be uh, in situations where he's talking about things like the natural world or animals. Um, he's very skeptical when it comes to people uh, and their claims, maybe of the divine. Um, but the animal world, I think, is maybe just as magical to him as uh, the, the pantheon, <laughs> uh, as divinity. Um, and anything is maybe possible there. So that's why, you know, large dog-sized ants that can search for gold maybe are not all that weird to him. Um, so I do think that even though he has inaccuracies, um, although he's, he's surprisingly accurate in many ways, uh, he does have inaccuracies, but I don't think it's intentional at all. Um, another thing to keep in context with this, as I was reading it, when I was reading those sorts of outlandish things, is that so much of this would have been written to be heard aloud by an audience. And that audience would have been drawn in by those more outlandish stories. So uh, Herodotus, he knows how to spin a yarn, um, and he does a great job with that. And I, for one, really enjoyed it. Uh, another criticism that Herodotus has been uh, thrown at him <laughs> is uh, that he is prone to digressions, uh, that he seems to kind of go off the tr off track for a while and go down roads, often of ethnography and culture. He goes down very long paths, um, telling us about people and their history. And, you know, the overall narrative of this is actually the Persian War, um, which he was writing this around 430 uh, BCE. And the Persian War had happened uh, the, the Persian invasion of Greece had happened you know, two generations before Herodotus, but he would have grown up probably with people who would have had a living memory of it. Um, and that's the overall arc of this book, and that's where he finally eventually really gets to. But in the first couple of books, it seems like digressions, but I think digressions sound too much like he's off topic, and I don't really think he actually is. He's giving us necessary background, uh, or at least background that will really more greatly help us to understand the situation uh, in which the Persian War occurred and the people who were involved. Um, rather than digressions, I kind of consider them more detours, because uh, I think that he does have his eyes on the prize. Uh, he does bring us back to the point. He just doesn't let us know he's going on one of those detours. So I think that can be frustrating for some readers. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, Herodotus himself, um, you know, the man who invented history, uh, was he the first one to really write history? Maybe not, not exactly, uh, but he, he probably does it the most, for the first time, the most truly. Um, you know, history comes from the, uh, the Greek word uh, to inquire, and he is an inquiring mind. He has this wonderfully contagious uh, curiosity, and he does make for a terrific travel companion, because this is not only a history, it is also something of a travel log. Uh, he has been to many of the places that he's talking about. He was very well-traveled for his time period. Um, and it's great to hear some of his first-hand accounts, even if some of his memories, I think, are wrong. Uh, I think, you know, some things that he's said, again, have been proven to be wrong, but he wasn't writing, he wasn't wandering all that time with notepads and taking meticulous notes. Uh, you know, he was drawing on a lot of memory, and we all know that memory cannot necessarily be believed. Uh, you know, sometimes it does lead us astray. Um, and I think that maybe happened with him a few times. Um, but regardless, uh, his never-ending curiosity and also in a surprising open-mindedness, uh, he, you know, for a Greek um, who, you know, had, you would expect him to speak horribly of the Persians, okay, of the so-called barbarians. And he doesn't really, uh, you know, yes, he thinks that they were wrong. He he is a Democrat, small d. Um, he loathes autocracy uh, and tyranny, um, but he is very fair overall to the Persians, uh, as, as fair as we can possibly expect an ancient person of his time period to be. Uh, he does seek to understand them, and he doesn't blame them for everything. Um, and I said I had a great time with this book. Uh, I loved hearing the stories. Sometimes uh, the action gets actually pretty riveting, uh, especially with uh, Thermopylae um, when he's recounting that battle. Uh, it's it's terrific stuff. Um, the the uh, landmark edition in particular. Okay, so this is this is a chunker of a book. Um, I was able to read this in about a month and a half. Uh, 
because it was over the summer. <laughs> so I had time to sit down at my desk with this guy open um, and devote some time every single day to reading a little bit more. Uh, when we read Thucydides, which I think is going to be during the school year, I'm not sure how quickly I'll be able to get through that one. Um, but the essay for this, the introductory essay by, uh, was it, um, is it Robert Strauss? Did he write the actual introduction? Um, or did he just edit? No, the introduction is by Rosalind Thomas. Uh, a very good introduction. And throughout the text, we do have archaeological visuals. Uh, there is an abundance of footnotes. And we also have within the margins there, uh, little summaries of sections. So it's very easy to find information and to go back and look for it. And we also have a multitude of maps to help us along. Uh, to let us know where in the ancient world we're supposed to be talking about. Um, I do kind of wish that there were maybe some more battle maps in here. I kind of understand why there isn't. I think that he would have had to, the, the editor, would have had to rely exclusively on Herodotus's uh, explanation because so much since then has changed geographically. Um, I know that was at least the, uh, the situation with Thermopylae. Um, but battle maps would have, I think, helped me visualize a lot better uh, some of the stuff that was going on in here. Um, but yeah, I, I came away with a, a terrific respect for Herodotus. Um, he was really one of the first ones to start writing in prose, uh, which ended up being the perfect um, format for inquiry. Because uh, unlike poetry, uh, which many you know, previous uh, people who wrote about history uh, did in the ancient world, um, prose does not need the muse. So he is not taking, you know, he's not claiming any kind of divine inspiration for this uh, in any way or anything like that. He is just a mortal man who is endlessly curious and wants to know about what happened uh, in this great conflict, right, that occurred before he was born. That he, But I'm sure he, of course, grew up hearing about. Uh, he grew up in Halicarnassus, which was actually a part of the Persian Empire uh, for a long time. He spent a lot of time in Athens, um, and he came to love their democracy. Uh, came to love Athens overall, and he eventually does move to present-day Italy, um, and of course traveling a lot in between. And as he's writing this, the Peloponnesian War has broken out. Uh, Athens and Sparta, who were united, uh, like many Greeks were, against the Persians, uh, it is now seemingly tearing the ancient Greek world apart. And he seems to be lamenting that towards the end of this as well. Um, but yeah, would I recommend this? Yes. Would I recommend this edition? Absolutely. Uh, I do want to pick up the landmark Thucydides, although I believe that was the first one published, and I think that one maybe has some of the most um, gripes, uh, that every edition has kind of improved since that one. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I really like what they're doing here, and I really appreciate all those visuals and footnotes. Um, so yeah, uh, Landmark Herodotus was an absolute winner for me. Um, love the histories, and I can definitely see rereading this because I certainly have forgotten a lot already. There's a lot of information at you, and I see why this is something that people go back to over and over again. Uh, so at this point in the video, I'm going to switch over to showing you some swords uh, that are, of course, reproductions, but they are reproductions uh, from time periods or, you know, essentially cultures that Herodotus uh, is directly referencing and letting us know about. So if you're interested in that, you stick around for the rest of the video and uh, see those swords. All right, thank you. So the two swords that I'm going to show you, um, one of them is a Scythian sword and the other one is a Greek sword. Uh, first and foremost, I am not claiming to be an expert in either of these swords. Uh, they are just things that I own. Uh, some people who will watch my channel have expressed interest in uh, my sword collection, and I thought this would, be, uh, this would be a good opportunity to actually show some of them, okay? But uh, do not uh, count me as a, you know, a valid historical resource for these, um, but it's all just for fun, okay? So the first thing, this is a Scythian sword, okay? Um, I had actually picked this up about at least 20 years ago. I believe Windless Steel Crafts made this. I got it as a gift for my wife uh, <laughs> when we first started dating, actually. Uh, that's the kind of, you know, geeky uh, person I am. I bought my wife swords, uh, although she bought me a sword as well uh, right around that time. Um, but when I looked on the internet uh, a little while back, I actually couldn't even find evidence that this sword was ever sold or made. 
Um, but anyway, to talk about this, um, the original Scythian sword would have been iron. Um, I actually don't even know if it would have had a uh, hidden tang construction. It might have actually just been all more like one iron piece. But this does get the size uh, pretty much accurate. Um, and, you know, the, the silhouette too. So, yeah, I mean, you can see some of the fittings on here. See, it's a nice, nice, elegant looking uh, little sword. Uh, obviously ideal for stabbing. Okay. Uh, the other sword that I am going to show is a Greek, and I'm a little bit iffy on what we call this. Um, here in the U.S., we tend to say Xiphos. I do believe that that is inaccurate, though. I think that the Greek pronunciation is more like Xiphos, Xiphos or something like that. I am erring on the side of caution, and I'm going to try and say something more like Xiphos, but you, I might be totally wrong. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, but again, this is another one that originally would have been iron and not steel. Uh, you can see the kind of leaf blade shape. It is a shorter sword, but with that leaf blade, it does still give you some really nice momentum. Uh, the hilt construction on here is pretty good. And this does look quite a bit like the historical pieces. <clears throat> now, this was made by Devil's Edge, uh, which is sold in the U.S. by uh, a website called Cult of Athena, uh, which deals a lot in historical uh, reproductions of edge weapons. And I think they are the only, um, the only uh, provider for Devil's Edge. Uh, Devil's Edge had, has had some issues um, with quality control uh, for their blades. And I got this one actually half price in a munitions grade uh, because it does have some defects. There are some blemishes on the blade. You can see, you might be able to make it, there you go, you can probably see that. Um, it does have a little bit of a bend in the blade as well. Uh, if I paid full price for this, that would bother me, but I knew that I was getting something that was not going to be perfect and a little bit defective, and I really just wanted to try out a Greek sword. As I was reading Herodotus, I got the urge, as I usually do, <laughs> to go swinging around a sword, and on a whim, I started looking up Greek swords, and I found this, and it was only about like 75 bucks, um, and I am perfectly fine, especially with that tiny little bend, which I can, if I worked at it, I can, I can get it really straight again. Uh, but as I said, the original would have actually been iron. There's a very obnoxious bird yelling at me right now. Um, would have been iron, which would have actually been prone to bending anyway. So because there's a little bit of a defect in here, it actually accidentally makes it a little more historically accurate. Uh, but anyway, this is this is the, uh, the Greek Xiphos, okay? And once again, here is the Scythian uh, short sword. And uh, I don't think that bird's going to go anywhere. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I will put, uh, again, an archaeological piece of this. I don't think I've said that yet, um, that this is actually uh, com being compared to. Uh, I'll put that right at the end of the video um, so you can compare this to a, an actual piece. All right. So anyway, thank you for